pardon Lon about what to talk to uh, at the workshop here. It's my first time. Uh, and then I went to the website, actually <coughs> find out what it's all about. Looks like it's about awareness of cybersecurity risks. And I realized I need to talk about ransomware. So obviously all of you heard of ransomware, about the crypto ransomware, but I don't think we talk about it enough because it you know, keeps claiming one victim after another, people losing money. And it's, uh, generally speaking, it's the most challenging, the most disruptive, the most difficult, the most innovative threat that we've, uh, we've ever seen. Obviously not talking about the threats that may attack the critical infrastructure or disrupt power plants, but talking about the threats that, um, and the risks that are real for, for us as a society as a whole, right? <laughs> So what is so different about crypto ransomware compared to all the other threats? So first of all, and I'm talking from the position from like an antivirus company in particular. So first of all, it, it pr produces an immediate and irreversible damage right away. So most of the malware, we do have an opportunity to respond, to react, to release protection, clean it up, do some sort of remediation. With ransomware, mm -hmm. when it's, you know, once it infects your machine, encrypts your files, boom, that's it, right? Second problem, it's pretty global. So yeah, most malware is global and very opportunistic, but in this particular case, uh, unlike say banking malware that tries to target a specific country, specific bank, uh, ransomware, crypto ransomware could make money everywhere in any, any jurisdiction because everybody's got files to protect. Uh, anybody can buy Bitcoin, so you don't really need to worry about uh, like payment infrastructures and so on. Uh, Crypto, crypto ransomware at the, at the same time, even though it's very, very global, uh, it does have a form of geotargeting. So obviously there's certain malware uh, families that are more prevalent in you know, US and Canada and different ones in Europe, but overall any country can be affected. We also have observed uh, the um, concept of untargeting. There are certain countries where crypto ransomware just simply doesn't run. So if you take, for example, the Loki ransomware, which was you know, quite prevalent just recently, uh, it has a special code that looks for the system language settings, and if if it's an, you know if it's Russian, and it just terminates itself and destroys itself. Uh, so kind of said by truth, I think somebody's trying to frame Russians, but um, it, it is pretty user agnostic, so it can affect anyone: corporate user, home user, public sector. Uh, it also platform agnostic, so pretty much you know any platform could be affected by ransomware. Obviously, PCs and Windows platforms the most um, kind of hit most hard by it, but we started to see uh, Linux-powered web servers infected with ransomware. Uh, we see some examples of OSX, Android phones, even though it's not encrypting your files, but it's kind of taking your phone device as a hostage. So yeah, it is pretty, pretty platform agnostic. It's also easy to hide and hard to disrupt. Uh, so they've adopted all the kind of new technology in the form of Tor, or bitcoins, and you know the money trail is practically untraceable. So unlike say with uh, like fake antivirus, where they had to process payments uh, with uh, credit cards, so they need to find some somebody to um, do the acquiring and you know payment processing, and you could go and trace money and find out who who the guy is behind it, and you can disrupt it. With 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 crypto ransomware, it's pretty difficult to do, right? Because it's it's very anonymous. They hide their pay payment infrastructure pretty well in the Onion network, and the bitcoins make it make it untraceable. It also has very low cost of operation. So if you talk about banking malware, for example, phishing malware, it needs to have an infrastructure of, say, you know, having a money mule network to all, you know, do all the withdrawals, do the money laundering. So it is quite complicated. It requires a lot of investment into this kind of organized cyber crime. With ransomware, anyone can become a part of the affiliate network that promotes ransomware, start making money, and it's very low cost of, uh, cost of operation and low barrier of entry. Finally, it's highly persuasive. It's openly criminal, unlike many other soft, you know, malware that is trying to be like very hidden and kind of pretend that it's good. Uh, ransomware is openly criminal, and it has a lot of different ways to convince you that you actually need to pay up and you need to do it fast. So one of the examples that we saw just recently with a new malware family called Jigsaw, it actually starts deleting and destroying files. You know, if it doesn't get the ransom paid as quickly as possible, so you know, every hour I don't remember the exact time frame, it will be deleting another file. It's almost like killing hostages, <laughs> right? Until you pay. So it is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, they also may increase the price that you need to pay if you, if you, you know, start thinking longer about whether you should pay or not. So yeah, uh, user awareness is of limited use in this case. With fake antivirus, we could tell everybody just don't pay for the antivirus that says, you know, that suddenly appeared on your computer. We'll remove it. You know, if you got infected with ransomware, you know, it doesn't matter. 
So a little bit of history. This is where it's all started. Even though crypto ransomware, I think we saw some examples of it, of it as early as 2005 and maybe even in the MS-DOS ways, but this is where it really took off with so-called Windows Locker uh, ransomware. Uh, and it was extremely prevalent in um, Russian-speaking countries. It was used in the SMS, premium SMS uh, uh, payment services as a way to monetize. Uh, it'll you know, lock your screen. Uh, in this particular case, they you know, they claim that you violated the uh, the rights of using the you know internet, and the reason you know the violation was actually you watching um, you know gay adult videos, and apparently that seemed like a you know like a violation of internet uh, usage rights uh, in, in Russia anyway. Um, so and then you 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 send a text a premium SMS text message, and um, this is what it end up. Uh, what would end up happening if you look at the Google Trends, which is my favorite tool for researching certain kind of trends in cybercrime as well. And you look f uh, for WinLocker, you'll see that the only people searching for WinLocker were primarily from Russia, Ukraine, and this is kind of the overall overall trend. And at the time, I was worried because I, I knew about a lot of people in Russia and Ukraine, other countries in Eastern Europe, Europe being infected with this ransomware. And I, I knew that the SMS payment services won't, you know won't hold up here, and I was worried about like, hey, what if they figure out the way to monetize uh, in the in the Western world? And and obviously they did with all these prepaid cards. You've you know heard about it. You can buy them anywhere, and you can pay for you know you can pay ransom this way. And that's how we started to see a huge wave of all, all varieties of police locker ransomware. It wasn't the crypto ransomware at the time, but nevertheless, this is where the tides kind of changed. And we see again, looking at Google Trends, people searching for ransomware, people searching for WinLocker. You can see that you know the problem is has shifted to uh, to kind of Europe and uh, uh, North America quite a bit, and you know a big a big spike. So CryptoLocker was the first most successful uh, crypto ransomware. Uh, it relied on bitcoins for payment. Uh, we've managed to get access to one of those uh, wallets that were used by BitLocker and. Whether true or not, but I think we've observed around 17 million um, uh, U.S. dollars uh, in um, in kind of the transaction volume for BitLocker. It's hard to know how much money those individuals, you know, perpetrators, made, but this this could be quite a quite an accurate figure, quite an accurate figure. So another uh, another interesting trend, and it could be a pure coincidence, could be a conspiracy theory, but when you look at it, and this is the you know, the rise of CryptoLocker and people searching for CryptoLocker being the problem and the rise of the Bitcoin prices, you can see a strong correlation there, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is. It is a coincidence, but who knows, maybe there were other reasons. So that all gave, obviously, a very successful way of monetizing on malware. That gave a big growth and explosion to crypto ransomware in the recent years. Uh, this graph tracks the, you know, roughly, roughly the number of new crypto ransomware families that were created during the year. It's not number of samples, obviously, but unique families of different groups, different cybercrime groups uh, creating those ransomwares. So you can see in 2015 was the big growth year for ransom for crypto ransomware. 2016 isn't going to get any better, so we see there's a lot of new variants coming out. As I mentioned, like we've, we've observed two, two or three in the last month alone. Uh, and it, it gets it gets worse. Uh, this is news from February. Uh, uh, in this year, you must have uh, must have seen it, where one of the hospitals uh, in the U.S. Uh, became victim to ransomware, and they actually ended up paying seventeen thousand dollars. Right? That looks pretty bad if 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 we're talking about hospitals and the and the disruption that it caused, and uh, you know, ambulances were diverted, medical records disappeared. You know, the hospital couldn't operate. That's pretty scary. So let's talk a little bit about it happens. How, how do people get infected? So interestingly enough, email continues to be the most uh, common way for ransomware to spread. So it comes as an email with an attachment, usually an attachment containing, say, a Word document. Word document will uh, have a social engineering technique asking you to enable macros. And this particular this one is quite clever. It shows a bunch of gibberish and says, enable macro if the data encoding is incorrect. And you'll be like, well, yeah, of course I can't read it. Why don't I you know, turn the macros on? And when the macro runs, it downloads executable from a from an external website and it's able to execute it and that's what that's what you get as a result uh, recently there was a big wave of uh, stopped using word documents well kind of declined the use of word documents uh, uh, for a certain period of time and they switched to javascript so apparently you can you can you know open attachments a zip attachment with a javascript in it and you can execute it and it doesn't execute in the context of the browser anymore it executes in the context of your you know double script .exe application can do pretty much anything, just like any other executable. So what it does here is, 
it's highly obfuscated. You can see the uh, the variable names um, if you can if you can read it here, and the variable names actually form in the code that is there later being evaluated. So it is highly obfuscated, difficult to deal with. Um, you know, huge waves of uh, spam outbreaks with JavaScript. We've seen examples of other file formats. Like every time we you know learned how to deal with a particular outbreak, where you know there is something new that they come up with. In this case, there was a CHM file, which is apparently a Microsoft help file in XML or HTML format. It can also embed objects and OLI, and it will, you know, it can do all those nasty things as well. So it could could be pretty much anything, right? You know, OLI documents, HTML, JavaScript. We've seen jar, Java jar files used to spread um, ransomware. Uh, this is the graph that I built just literally yesterday. All those slides are brand new. Uh, this is the volume of um, Spam email containing a zip, you know, malicious zip attachment. And you can see that the, you know, 2000, beginning of 2006, 16 was definitely a big, uh, big spike, and primarily uh, promoting Loki, Tesla Crypt, uh, the Crypto Locker, the Copy Club had of the Crypto Locker ransomware, uh, and CTB Locker, also known as Tesla, uh, Tesla Crypt. Uh, we also see uh, crypto ransomware spreading uh, through exploit kits. So I'm sure you know what you know exploit kits, exploit kit attacks are. What's interesting about it? Again, there is you know there's quite a bit of geolocation involved. So depending on which country you're coming from, it will infect you with different type of ransomware. In some cases, it will avoid trying to infect you. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the problem with with uh, exploit kits is if you have an unpatched um, machine. Uh, then it can infect you, obviously it will infect you silently without any user content, uh, consent. So what's coming up next? So if you look at the uh, kind of crystal ball, uh, we would expect ransomware to be even more targeted, right? So when, um, you know, when, when they infect uh, a big organization like a hospital, uh, then the ransom amount goes, goes up quite a bit, right? And they can be much more creative uh, when they target a particular organization and, and much more demanding. Uh, there is talk about ransomware potentially switching to doxing, so it's not just about encrypting your documents and taking them hostage, but actually threatening, threatening you that your documents will be published on the web, mm -hmm. right, or your images will be published on the web. I'm not sure how well it will work, but I suppose in case of a targeted attack, it can be. So if you, you know, if you uh, threaten a particular organization that all their secret documents or their IP will be revealed on the, on the, on the net, I don't think they will like it. So it doesn't even need to be encrypted at that point. Or say you have a backup, right? Uh, we expect them to start tam doing more tampering with backups. So they're already uh, able to, you know, ransomware already tries to delete shadow copies um, on your machine post infection. But, you know, most likely it will start looking at the backup destinations and trying to destroy them. Um, it might start trying to take hostage uh, or make use of your uh, sensitive resources on your phone. So let's say taking. Um, audio from your microphone and your cell phone or taking video captures and again threatening you that um, this information will be published. SQL databases, maybe cloud services and storage, maybe a social network identity, so anything that is of value to you, ransomware could potentially target as a, uh, as a, as a hostage. Even, even critical infrastructure, let's not even start thinking about it because it's scary. So good news. On the protection side, uh, first of all, I'll say yes, traditional antivirus signatures don't work. They're always late. Yeah? So thankfully, uh, most of the antivirus, anti-malware industry have evolved to uh, include a large kind of stack of different technologies that are, that are helping us mitigate the attack. So the first angle that we're looking at is the infection prevention. So one of the, and again, this is looking at exploit kits delivering the payloads or spam attachments delivering the payloads. So you're looking at technologies like exploit mitigation. So Microsoft has one called the EMAT, um, and then there's other companies. So you know I'm pretty happy about us. Uh, Sophos getting the new technology like that from the Surfride acquisitions called Hitman Pro Alert, and it's basically looking for the exploit condition to happen on the machine. So it is very generic, very effective. Uh, you can start, you know, obviously chasing the exploit kits itself. It's a little bit of a case, you know, cat and mouse game, but it, it's useful. Uh, contextual detection, so you, you can be more aggressive with detecting JavaScript or documents with um, with macros that are coming via email, for example. Uh, URL blocking, not as effective, but you know, just just another layer. Application whitelisting for certain organizations, that's an option where they invest into kind of locking down their environments and making sure that only trusted executables can run on their machine. Again, nothing is you know 100% protection. Nothing is silver bullet. Uh, because there's always ways to break through uh, through the layer. 
Anti-spam is really important. So if you have a good anti-spam solution, then we'll you know mitigate the mitigate the attack quite quite well. Um, one of the most successful techniques that we've adopted is the behavior-based detection. So looking at what you know, what ransomware is actually doing, because it can come from a lot of different random websites and you know obfuscate and randomize things and try to evade AV detection. But at the end of the day, it needs to do something on the machine. And when we start recognizing what it's doing and we can profile it and we can write the behavioral signatures for that, that's where that's where we have the most success. So when we start scanning the memory, you know, when the ransomware is actually you know, unpacking itself and places itself its, its code in memory and we can look at what's what's there and we can recognize families. So this is the most most effective technique. And there are certain set of uh, tools available these days that are trying to um, kind of prevent the file, you know, as, as the files have been rewritten and encrypted by ransomware, they're trying to kind of recognize the, you know, the entropy change in certain behaviors, maybe save the file just before it has been written, things like that. Finally, um, I think we also can do a pretty good job with best practices and awareness. Uh, so regular backups, you know, stating the obvious, obvious, but, you know, be very, you know, diligent with it, making sure that offline copies are available for your backups. Uh, protection technology needs to be, you know, deployed at every level. I guess that, that way it works pretty well when you've just kind of um, covered every stage of the attack. Uh, user education. So, you know, if you, you know, if, if you talk to the organizations that need to do better in terms of user education, uh, influence them on running the uh, regular fission tests so that you can see um, well, you know, what, what are your weakest links in the organization, who is always clicking on those links, who is enabling those markers, and people will learn eventually not to, not to do those things. You can also impose stronger policies on, on kind of what type of content can come to your organization, right? Like, hey, why would I, why would I receive JavaScript as an attachment on email? So those things are obviously possible. Patch early, patch often, that will help you mitigate exposure to exploit-driven attacks. Uh, reduce your attack service in general, so this is the advice that goes uh, along with the previous one. So if you, if you don't have use for Java plugins in your organization or at home, why, why have a Java plugin in, you know, in, in your browser? Uh, the other one is separating and protecting sensitive data, because after all, what ransomware is doing is going after your data. So if you, if you, if you separate who can access your data, um, where it leaves, what security policies you deploy on the server itself, and then there are ways to mitigate it, right? So you can still access your data on the server, but possibly you can't modify it. But, or if it's been overridden, then at least there are shadow copies that are being left on the server that you can still recover from. And data access control. Restrict permissions, make sure people don't run, um, you know, their, don't operate their computers with admin rights. Obviously, it's not a, not a silver bullet. You know, this ransomware can still do harm even if you don't have, don't execute it with admin rights, but it, it obviously restricts its ability to be disruptive and gives you better chance to, to, to recover from the incident. I think that's it. Three minutes early. Well, well done. Thank you.